All right, good evening, everybody. Mrs. Himes, it's your meeting. Maybe you want to introduce the panel. How would you like to do that? Sure, I can do that. Um, welcome, everybody, to Harrison Avenue's uh, full reopening meeting. We're really glad to be able to bring you this presentation tonight. Um, presenting with me are Ms. Jen Spagnola, the assistant principal at Harrison Avenue. She's also going to be um, managing the slides in just a minute. Um, Dr. Lou Wool, assist, uh, superintendent of schools. Michael Greenfield, assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction. Brian Ladwig, our assistant superintendent for human resources. Uh, Jen Markarian, uh, Harrison Avenue's instructional specialist. Veronica D'Andrea, the district uh, director for mathematics K-12. Uh, Brian Seligman is behind the scenes, making sure that all of these moving parts work tonight. Uh, Jen Toscano, our elementary supervisor for special education is here. Christian McCourtney, our supervisor of elementary and education is here and board trustees, Kelly Mangan and Lindy Wolverton. Welcome everybody. Jen, are you ready to pull up the slides? Thanks. So Mrs. Spagnola and I uh, would like to thank the parent community for all you've done to support your child's learning this year um, and to support the entire community. Um, we've come this far in part because you have stayed with us through difficult times. Um, this year has not been without challenge for sure. Um, another group of people that I really want to recognize from the beginning is our teachers at Harrison Avenue. They have worked tire tirelessly to create the conditions for your children to continue to learn well this year. Um, and they've done things that, and been able to accomplish things that I would say a year ago, I would have thought were not possible. Um, and yet they did. There are many other people who are contributing to the ability for us to reopen. Um, I will recognize those people towards the end of the presentation. You'll hear about three main topics this evening. Um, health and safety protocols, social emotional learning for your child, and curriculum and instruction. Dr. Wolf? Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. We have now almost hit 260. So let me say that I'm excited to be here as well. We have mostly answers for you, but you're going to struggle through with a little more ambiguity for the next few days. Um, we have very good observant parents at Harrison Avenue School. I got a photograph sent to me today. Yes, that was the second delivery of our air filtration systems. We're expecting another delivery on Thursday and one on Sunday. Once I have a final answer that the Sunday delivery is on the road, which will happen Thursday a.m., I will send you a note. If that's to happen, then I will be delighted to inform you that all of our children will be coming back on Monday, K-5. If I don't hear that that's on the road, it may be possible, but I hope not, that we'll have a K-3 or K-4 opening with hybrid for another one or two days. But at this point in time, I don't have a solid answer. So breathe with me. I'm still very optimistic that we will hit the 22nd. And when I hear that that truck from Houston, Texas is on the road on Thursday, we're opening our buildings on Sunday for that final delivery. And that will get us enough air filtration units in every one of our elementary classrooms to bring everybody back on Monday. Um, I did meet today with the middle school and high school principal, and I will have a date to announce in uh, about 24 hours as to when we will be bringing back our uh, secondary students and I think you'll be happy that it's going to be sooner rather than later but I want to share that with the faculty before I share it here. Next slide please. So some of you have written me, many of you have written me, some quite well informed, some not as up to date as others. Why now? What's changed? Why didn't we do all of this stuff sooner? Well, some of the things as you'll learn tonight were not available to us at the start of the school year, but I have tried as hard as I can, along with members of the faculty and staff to stay current 
in an environment that is very confounding to fully grasp and understand. So all of our decisions are always made with the idea that your kids have to be safe and our teachers have to be safe. And we now have a, uh, a circumstance, I believe, where I can be pretty, pretty confident about both of those things. The other thing that I wanna alert you tonight, and you'll hear a lot more about this, is we're very concerned about the continuity of learning for your kids. We know that they've been up and down and hybrid and virtual, depending on whether they've been quarantined or not. But you will learn tonight, and I'm going to tell you in advance, that there will no longer be a hybrid model. You'll have the choice of coming to school in person every day, or you will choose to be virtual every day. I'm not a proponent of virtual every day because Zooming fatigue is a, is a reality. It's very hard for kids to stay engaged when they're not physically in the classroom. And while our teachers do a magnificent job, um, it will look different than our hybrid model. Your child will be permitted to zoom in every day. Many of you at home think that's a good idea. I would share with you that the research doesn't support it, but it's the best model we can provide as we bring all kids back. But as importantly to me, you know, this is not about making the buildings safe and say, welcome back, turn the lights on, school is back in session. We are all acutely aware, especially you moms and dads, that your children have gone through a roller coaster ride of emotion. Some of them have never met the other parts of their class, so they don't even know the other half. So bringing them back is going to require a certain amount of sensitivity on our part, a certain amount of planning, and a certain amount of reorientation. So we have a plan in place that I think will address those things, and it will be a celebration when we bring this communion of kids back together. Next slide, please. So lots of times people say to me, why don't you just? Um, because truly I don't get to just make the decisions that I would want to make. If I had that ability, your children wouldn't be coming back to schools with barriers on their desks, but some things are not within my control. The governor is one of the folks that has control and he has since the outset, prioritized returning students to full in-person instruction, and now we're able to do that. So that's one authority we respond to. Next slide, please. In priority order, the folks that make the rules that we adhere to, and I'm gonna update you on a rule that you probably have a misunderstanding of based on the governor's most recent uh, press conference, is the New York State Department of Health. They determine six feet, three feet, barriers, no barriers, hybrid, virtual, all of the things that we are governed by reside within the New York State Department of Health. I'm embarrassed to say they have not updated their guidance since August of this past summer. So we're working with very old guidelines. As some of you are well aware, I have advocated directly to them for critical changes in the guidance. Um, some of that has happened, some of it is not. We're now able to uh, not have to quarantine fully vaccinated teachers. That's a recent development. But I want to pull my colleague, Dr. Ladwig, in here because there is a great deal of confusion about the issue of quarantining. And some of you are making plans for spring break, working under a series of misconceptions. So Dr. Ladwig, could you explain to the folks at home what exactly the rules are at this moment in time? Sure. Thanks, Dr. Wool. And yes, they do change from day to day, and it's uh, challenging to keep up with them and to try to share reliable information with the community. Uh, many people have heard the governor's announcement that effective April 1st, the travel quarantine will be lifted. So that, according to that governor's announcement, people are led to believe that uh, they can travel without needing to quarantine upon their return. However, as recently as six o'clock tonight, I checked again. I check every day, but I checked today at six with the Department of Health to see if in fact uh, those guidelines will be adopted by the Department of Health. And uh, the simple answer is not yet. Uh, it seems that the governor and the Department of Health are slightly out of step with each other. And it's important to share with the community that we are obligated to follow New York State Department of Health guidance. And so at this moment, uh, if students travel over spring break and they return after spring break, they will be required to quarantine and follow the travel quarantine guidelines. 
Now this could change. Uh, Department of Health may issue guidance between now and spring break that will change that. But as of this moment, uh, New York State Department of Health has not adopted the guidance that says the travel quarantine is list lifted effective April 1st. Thank you, Brian. I also wanna reiterate that what applies to adults does not apply to children as well. Your children currently are not eligible to be vaccinated. So if you choose to go on vacation and you're fully vaccinated and the, the rules change, that would not apply to your children. And I wanna share with you one thing that I think is critically important. I'm gonna reinforce this message. Our ability to keep our schools open has more to do with the behavior in our community than it does with the behaviors in our school. We saw after um, we came back from our most recent winter break and the February break, a huge uptick in infections and um, children coming to school and forcing other kids to be quarantined at our high school. Spring break is coming. I've already had little birds whispering in my ear that some teenagers are being authorized or approved by their parents to travel for spring break. If your children are traveling, if you are traveling, you must adhere to whatever guidelines are in place. But remember, the guidelines that apply to teenagers are different than the ones that apply to adults because teenagers are currently not eligible to be vaccinated. So we're still operating under the New York State guidance from way back in August, not yet, Jen. And also, um, we are ruled to some extent by the New York State Department of Education. And I try as hard as I can to track the Centers for Disease Control World Health Organization. Unfortunately, sometimes their information is quite far ahead of our local state and we're stuck with old guidance. So understand that I don't get to make the decisions. By the way, in the chat, there's a very good question. Christine, this is for you. We're not worried at all about the turnaround. on del if, the, if the delivery comes on Sunday, we already have two crews set up. It's just a matter of rolling them off the truck and plugging them into classrooms. So we don't anticipate that will be a challenge at all, but thank you for mentioning it. That's why once I know the truck is on its way, we're all set for Sunday delivery. Next slide, please, Jen. So this is what I mentioned to you earlier. In the middle of this Venn diagram, there used to be the concept of hybrid learning. Hybrid learning is very time consuming for our professional staff. We learned this summer as we put together units of instruction and lessons that to design High quality independent learning took about three times as long as it does to design in person instruction where the teacher can supervise kids. So, hybrids going away. Also, going away, not happily, right? I make everybody a little bit unhappy. Our teachers are losing their additional prep time on Mondays. We'll go back to a normal schedule for school. So, all students will be in every day, all day. Next slide. By the way, anybody on this uh, panel can also uh, review these Q&As, and if you want to answer and publish, let them know. And uh, Valina, I hope I'm saying your first name, what percentage of teachers and administrators have been vaccinated already? We don't know that precisely. Um, teachers don't have to answer. We can ask, but we believe we're way over at this point, 80 to 90 percent. It may even be higher. We were able, with your help, moms and dads, to mandate uh, of the county executive that each school district be given specific days for their faculty and staff as a matter of fact just this past week Thursday and Friday at uh, Westchester Community College was dedicated to any of our staff that hadn't yet received their vaccine so we feel very confident that our staff has had good access at this point and we're well on the way to having anybody that is medically able to take the vaccine to have had access to it. So let's just talk about this virtual option. Maybe this will answer some of the questions in the chat. We want this model to be flexible, but we also want it to be reasonable for teachers. There's a lot of demand on teachers, right? They're fatigued. They've been through a great deal over the course of this year. So once you choose the virtual option, the rule is, but it's not hard and fast, you should stay out for the full marking period. In this case, that would mean till the end of the year. However, if you develop a sense of confidence that you'd like to come back, you can appeal to your principal. And if we're not going to disrupt a currently constructed class, it's not going to change the dynamic of a class, we're going to invite you back as soon as we can fit you in. But that will be on a case-by-case -case basis. A couple of other things, though, that we would like your help with. 
So some folks, we've all been through a lot. We haven't seen our families, wanted to take your kids away. So you've moved to virtual learning. From this moment forward, we're defining vacation as the time that school is not in session. So if you decided to take a family vacation when school is in session, we would likely not honor your request to be a virtual learner. There might be a circumstance where there's some pressing need in your family. We're always going to be mindful that there are various circumstances, but we really encourage you, once you make the commitment to be in person, to respect the work of the teacher and try to be there. If you're going to participate virtually, big change. You're going to do it every day. It's not going to be with the hybrid model. You're not going to be a Husky or Pride. You're going to be in every day. You're expected to have your camera on so teachers can see you. Um, and if you're ill, we want you to stay in bed and get better. But if you feel as if you're capable and your teacher's willing, we'll allow you to zoom in on those days, although we do not encourage that. However, if you're one of those students who becomes quarantined, we will always, of course, allow you to participate virtually. So we're going to try to be as flexible as we can. But if you decide at the last minute you want to change, that's probably not going to be doable in, in, in a short window of opportunity, like 24 hours. So flexibility, yes. Please respect the work of teachers. If you make a commitment to come to school, come to school. If you have some extenuating circumstance, of course, share it with your principal. We'll be as flexible as we can, but I'm going to say this a lot tonight. We have asked Herculean tasks of our teachers. Let's try to make their lives easier as we transition back. Next slide. So a lot has changed and we have changed with it. Um, that is actually a picture, of Harrison Avenue students standing next to that giant filtration system. When we had them delivered at the Preston School, the kids were jumping up and down. They thought they were ice cream machines. Mr. Courtright had a bunch of disappointed second graders. So what's changed? The first is we now have access to vaccination for faculty and staff. So when this journey started for us back in the summer, in those very dark and scary times, we were always, of course, concerned about the health and safety of your children. But our primary concern, frankly, because COVID affects adults so much more severely, was our adult population. Our teachers were, of course, very frightened at that point. It was unknown territory. So we had no way of protecting adults, and now we do. And as I just mentioned to you, pretty much everybody has access to the vaccine already. We've begun working with your principals and Dr. Laidwig implementing surveillance testing. What's the purpose of surveillance testing? Well, we want to know what the infection rate is in our school. And in theory, what we're supposed to be doing, but I don't have the data because New York State has yet to provide it, the infection rate in our community. Those two numbers are supposed to dictate the level of mitigation that we implement in our schools according to the CDC guidance. However, we're going to continue to ad administer a very high level of mitigation anyway. But one of the other things I asked the CDC to do, I'm, I'm sorry, the New York State Department of Health, was to give us our local data. So we've implemented surveillance testing. And then I got a kind of a snarky letter from a parent saying, why didn't you buy these air filtration systems back in September? Really simple answer, they hadn't been invented yet. Uh, this is a very different kind of filtration system. It's not a Home Depot model. These are uh, industrial grade. And in your Harrison Avenue classrooms, they'll typically exchange and cleanse the air three, all the way up to seven times in a 45 minute period, typically three to five. And they're not just changing the air, they're removing virus from it using MERV, HEPA, and uh, UV light. Um, we tested them in classrooms. We had them field tested in our own classrooms. They don't make much noise. They have lots of safety features. The teacher can control the, the range of mitigation. So at 30%, you get the three to five, but if the room is empty, they can crank it up. It's a really quiet machine, hum, really more than a noise. And unfortunately, my reason for meeting with the New York State Department of Health over the February break was to admonish them about the waste of money for placing barriers around every desk. Here's why. Barriers actually make ventilation less effective. They make cleaning less effective, but mostly they degrade the experience of the classroom. 
the kids are in these little barriers and I'm sitting at my desk now. I want you to imagine you're sitting in a trifold. Kids don't lean into barriers. They go back and say, hey, how are you today? And the moment they step outside of their little trifold, they're fully exposed. So they don't really add much value. And we've learned that a two-ply mask, here's one, if I wear one and you wear one, we reduce the transmission rate by over 91%. So ventilation, surveillance testing, vaccination, masks. Barriers, unfortunately, is a rule that I couldn't get them to change, but uh, I'm gonna continue to work at it. All the other things that we've been doing to keep your kids safe, like disinfecting the building every single night in every room will continue. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we will that we have done since the beginning of the year, but we will continue to do is to promote good hygiene in our schools. Um, there is signage around the building that reinforces regular hand washing. Um, they'll continue to be posted. There are hand sanitizers just about every place you look in school. Um, and they are strategically located where students can have access to them. Um, they'll also be outside in the playground. There was a question about the playground. Mrs. Spagnola is going to speak to that um, in just a few minutes. I know that's kind of a hot topic. Um, many children do bring their own water bottles to school. We encourage this because we have water bottle, bottle filling stations um, throughout the school as opposed to uh, traditional water fountains. Oh, I think I recognize is that Bill? <laughs> it is. I think this is you. It is. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so we're going to continue to cl clean our school facilities on uh, a nightly basis and throughout the day. Um, our custodians um, are in classrooms and in office spaces, uh, cleaning high touch areas um, and sanitizing as well. Um, they're using EPA approved school safe cleaning products um, that are effective on the coronavirus uh, and the machine that you see our own uh, Billy Pavesi using um, is the disinfector that we use overnight every night um, in every instructional space in the classroom. Okay, so it was just a pause for a couple of questions. So I think I answered uh, Marco's question. You can zoom in if you're quarantined. Um, giving the learning schedule prior to March 22nd, we have a whole section we're going to talk about learning loss. I promise we'll come back to it. And Jennifer's asking why are other school districts in the county open without barriers? You can be open without barriers if you're socially distanced at six feet. That's how we've been doing it. Once you move to three feet, unfortunately, the guidance from August still requires us to maintain barriers. And then uh, will you begin accepting rapid tests? We don't make that decision. That's a decision that rests with the, the New York State Department of Health. And how will you address symptoms of allergies? Same way we have. None of our medical protocols. Dr. Levy, you want to answer that question? Or sure, yeah, we recognize that this is the season when allergies are going to start appearing. And um, we also need to be mindful that those allergy or those symptoms could actually be the sign of coronavirus. So we are indicating that if a child has uh, known symptoms like allergies, a parent can get a letter from a doctor to indicate that that's a, a known condition that the child's been treated for and that they're not required to test for COVID. We get that doctor's note, then uh, we don't need to require testing or uh, isolation for that child. And just to say out loud, we know that that's a pain in the neck, but one of the reasons we've been able to be so successful at keeping the schools open during this pandemic is following strict guidelines. And you've been so cooperative and we really appreciate it. This is a very important slide and, and Mrs. Himes is gonna take you through. By the way, I love these pictures. I don't know who took them, but they're really cute. Um, Snacks are a huge thing in elementary school. It's like the most important thing in the world. So Mrs. Himes is going to talk yeah. about masks and how you eat a brownie through your snack. No, go ahead. Um, so the wearing of face coverings is going to continue to be a requirement for uh, staff, faculty, students, and anybody else who is in the building at all times, with the exception of eating, uh, drinking, and any medical condition any medical conditions that we may be aware of. Um, we're gonna talk about snacks in just, in just a minute. 
um, more specifically when we talk about uh, lunch and recess and those topics, um, but they will still occur, um, some in larger spaces. Um, the teachers have already begun to take advantage of the great weather and use outdoor spaces um, and the option to split them into split the students into two groups is also uh, a possibility. Uh, Jen will take you through that in just a minute. Um, we will provide masks if your if your kids don't have them or if they need them. And visitors will still be limited in school as we reopen. And when they are here, we will uh, still require them to wear face coverings. Yeah, uh, we'll we wanted... to fill out our little chart for us. And yes, of course, we're going to talk about lunch. Yes. Probably more than you want to hear. Next slide, Jen. Thanks. And there are those beautiful barriers. As I said, state mandated, not by choice. We tried really hard to, we offered alternatives. We said, what if we buy face shields? Because at least they don't degrade the sound in the classroom. And I do think we're going to get movement on this eventually. Unfortunately, we've already purchased them. They're here. They're being installed as we speak. Classroom furniture will mostly be arranged at three feet of distance. If we can get three feet, one inch, it's actually more helpful to us. It means you, if somebody's exposed, they don't have to quarantine as many kids. Here's where we really, really, really need your help. I apologize for my mantle clock in the background. We really need your help. If you can continue to transport your children, it would be very helpful if you did, because that allows us to social distance children on buses. Uh, we won't know that until everybody's filled out the survey. If you haven't filled out the survey, I'm Dr. Lady, we can put it in the chat for you again. But it's very helpful to us if you can. If not, we'll figure out what it is we have to do because ideally we'd like to still keep one child on a bus unless they're siblings. Signage is going to be the same. You're all, you're all kind of getting good at this, right? It's your whole life now. This is actually really important uh, in every building, isn't it, Val? It is. Um, I'll let you drop Sure. Um, uh, certainly, if your child needs a bus, um, he or she will be able to take the bus. As uh, Dr. Wool said, we're encouraging um, people to perhaps drive their children to school if you can, drop them off, or walk on a nice day if you um, live close enough. Um, we realize anybody who's been in the Harrison Avenue parking lot also realizes that this creates an additional challenge. Um, it is true that the queue, uh, at least initially when we reopen, will likely be backed up. Um, we'll have people outside in the parking lot to direct traffic and we'll move kids through as quickly as we can. Uh, but in a minute, I'm going to speak about the uh, daily screenings that are still going to be required. So it will uh, require patience on everybody's part. Um, the windows will be open on the bus whenever possible. As Dr. Will said, siblings will be allowed to sit together. And to the extent that we can, we will socially distance the students on the bus. Uh, our school bus drivers do wear face coverings as well. Hey, before you exchange slides, I just want to underscore something that Mrs. Heim said that is so important. We realize that the drop off sometimes is tough, that it takes time. And it's tougher now that we're encouraging you to all drive. So I would ask that we all remember to extend one another grace, a little bit more patience. Uh, that's so important for the way our kids see us modeling and also to our teachers. Everybody's in a new world. And as this happens, it's almost, somebody said to me, it's like opening school for the third time today. I was talking to a group of teachers and they said, I, I said, are you excited? They said, we're excited, but we're tired. And that makes good sense. I think they're gonna be rejuvenated when they see your kids but we can all help each other so much by just extending a little bit of grace and patience. So thanks. Dr. Wool, there are um, a number of questions in the chat. I'm gonna let them sit there for, for just a minute if that's okay, because sure. the slides that are up and coming will address most of it. Uh-huh, sure. Okay. So we appreciate um, the fact that you have filled out those uh, daily health screenings every day, it is one more thing to add to your morning, but it is something um, that has also helped us to keep track of uh, students' health and their ability to come to school. Um, now that we are going to be open five days, you will have to complete that questionnaire daily. 
um, students and staff as well. Um, all visitors who are coming to school will also have to fill out the questionnaire and have a temperature screening. Um, the barcodes on your children's backpacks will also continue to be scanned each morning. Um, those are some of the elements that we believe have helped to keep us open. So we will continue with that. And we can probably run through these pretty quick, quickly. Um, Rosa, the answer is we don't have to wait for air filtration systems. I'm choosing to do that with the support of the board because I want the environment to be healthy for your kids. We know that even though kids don't get sick much when they do, some get very sick. And sometimes if a child's infected, they have a very heavy load of virus. And that's going to build up in a classroom where the kids are socially distanced at three feet. I just shared with you that my research indicates that barriers actually are not particularly helpful. So the filtration systems are the cornerstone of our uh, attempt to make your schools safe for children. Um, will there be a, we're gonna answer all the pickup stuff later, Val, the staggered pickup and all that. Yeah, okay. In the next few slides. Okie doke, so everybody just sit tight. And I uh, don't know, uh, Mrs. Himes will get back to, I'm sure, We'll get back to the concept of kindergarten graduation because that is important. I like to call it kindergarten commencement. Next slide. So some Please. of the questions that have come up about arrival and dismissal, um, I'll just go over quickly with everyone. Um, morning arrival times and the entrances in which your children go to in the morning will remain the same. Um, students can come to school as early as eight o'clock and the bell will ring again at 8.50 as usual. Um, students will be scanned at the following locations which have not changed. Kindergartners and first graders at Matthew Street, second and third in the new wing door and fourth and fifth graders at the front main door. Um, once inside, students will report to designated areas where they'll be socially distanced and monitored and um, they will wait for the bell to ring at 8.50 in those locations. Um, we do ask that um, parents, if you do drop your kids off and walk them to the door, that you remember to wear your masks um, and also socially distance. As more kids come in, um, there will be, we're anticipating a little bit of a backup <laughs> to start, um, but as we get used to the system, um, even since the beginning of the year, we've become very proficient in getting kids in, um, but please, any, Patience would be greatly appreciated at that time, at this time. Also, if you're using the drop-off queue, um, as Dr. Wool had mentioned before, it does get quite busy. Um, so if you could please pull up, have your child independently get out of the car curbside along the side of the building, um, that would be great. If, you know, parents, we encourage you to stay in the car um, because we want to keep the queue moving. So if we can get kids to, again, independently get out of the car, um, shut the door and walk into school, that would be great without parents um, getting out of their cars. And before you go on, I just want to address one question. Please don't misunderstand us. If you need to use the buses, don't worry about it. Use the buses. We do not want to make this hard on families. We will figure it out. You only need to drive your child if it's possible, but do not feel that that's something we expect you to do. If you can do it, great, and if you can't. And by the way, if you can do it sometimes, you can't do it all the time, request the bus. Don't worry about asking for things you need. If you can extend the ability to transport your child, great, and if not, no worries. Dr. Wold, there's a question about uh, where parents will park in the parking lot. Uh, the parking lot at Harrison Avenue uh, has always been a challenge. It will, will continue to be. Yeah. I wish I had um, a better answer for you. But that being said, uh, not every parent parks and gets out of the car with their child in the morning. Uh, many parents drop their children off in the queue. Uh, if you choose to park at, at drop off in the morning, um, there will likely be a spot, a spot because kids come anywhere between 8 and 8.50. At dismissal time, it is a bigger challenge. Um, sometimes you will wait um, for a, a spot and, and that queue has, has gotten better over time, um, but it will take longer than you may think it should 
um, at you know at, at dismissal time in particular. We will do, we do the best we can to move that queue along um, and ask everybody once you know you have your child to to please exit so that uh, so that the queue moves along as quickly as possible. Right. All of the challenges we had pre-COVID are still there. We don't we don't have a new parking lot, so you know you'll use Nelson Avenue, but I think patience will go a long way. Lou, the questions about uh, graduation keep coming up. Do you mind if I just quickly uh, address them? Oh man, I was going to make them wait until they. No, sure, of course you can. Um, last year, I'm sure you all remember, was a very challenging springtime for both the academic. Uh, piece of your child's program, but also the celebratory uh, pieces as well. We did find a way to celebrate our, um, our our seniors in high school, our fifth graders, our eighth graders, and our kindergartners. Um, for our kindergartners uh, and for our fifth graders, we had, um, I think they were calling them car parades last year. Um, the conditions are, are changing, you know, quickly and as they continue to change, we will do what we did last year, meaning we will assess the environment, assess the conditions and the rules and whatever it is we are permitted to do, we will look to uh, make it happen. Uh, since we were able to uh, pull off all of these experiences last year, uh, I'm confident that we will uh, celebrate our graduates uh, this year. Uh, we will know what form that will take uh, as the spring moves on. Yeah, we're actually working out a plan right now. You see that I changed my backdrop to celebrate graduation. We will absolutely get you an in-person graduation unless we're prohibited from doing it. As Valerie said, if we were able to do it in last year's circumstances, I'm confident we're gonna be able to do it again. Unfortunately, or fortunately, Wegmans is open now, so we can't abscond with their parking lot. Next slide. Yep. And yes, outdoor graduation is on the table. Uh, absolutely. To absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. That's likely the way it's going to occur. So here's all your dismissal questions answered in one fell slide. Yes. So the location um, for dismissal will remain the same for all grade levels. Um, we did increase and stagger sometimes in order to promote social distancing and less crowding. Um, this will also, by staggering the times, allow teachers a bit more time to dismiss a greater number of students, especially in locations that are shared for dismissal. Um, highlighted in purple are the times that have been changed or will change once everybody returns in full. Um, kindergarten will be changed to 255. You were originally 305. Grade two um, is now 250 and grade five also at 250 p.m from 2.55 p.m. So your times might have shifted five or 10 minutes. Um, we do again ask that you continue to wear a mask when you're on school grounds, picking your children up um, we, and stay socially distanced. We wanna make sure that we are good role models for our kids. Um, we also ask that once you pick your child up that you leave the school grounds. Um, we know the weather's getting really nice. It's so tempting to linger um, and hang around. But um, you know, we still want to try to limit the number of people on school grounds um, and limit the number of people gathering together. And we'll talk more about that later. And there's a good reason that we don't want you to stay on school grounds after school because we're not supervising what's going on in that environment. And you'll see that there is some wonderful news coming up in a slide or two ahead. And Shauna, stay with us. All your band questions are gonna be answered soon. Okay, so here's the big one, lunch and recess. Yikes. I know there's lots of questions um, surrounding um, the event that the kids look really forward to each day. Um, so lunch and recess, they, you know, it really plays an important, oops, sorry. I'm manning this here, I hit a button. Um, so lunch and recess play a really important role in your child's day. It allows them to relax and socialize with their friends um, and classmates. Um, the times for lunch for every grade level will remain the same. There are no changes in the schedule for their lunch period. Um, but due to the six foot rule, when kids do not have masks on, they will, um, while they're eating lunch, they have to remain six feet apart. Um, because of this, we are going to have to utilize a lot of different lunch locations to keep our kids safe and six feet apart, such as the cafeteria, classrooms, the auditorium, and some hallways. 
Um, once the weather is nice and weather permitting, we will also rotate kids outside to eat as well. Um, your children will stay with their class during lunchtime, but they will rotate to different locations. So they won't always be eating in the same location in a six day cycle. Um, and again, classes will um, eat together as a class. As for recess, um, so students are going to continue to be co cohorted by class during recess time. Um, good news, the playground will be open, hooray. <laughs> we will be using the playground as a, as a rotation, meaning that one class will be able to use the playground. And luckily at Harrison Avenue, we have a lot of fields and a lot of blacktop basketball areas. Um, so we will rotate children to different locations outside. Um, so everyone one will get an opportunity to get into the playground. And another good, other good news is that we've ordered balls and jump ropes. So there will be equipment for kids to use at recess time. Um, we will make sure that the, the equipment is sanitized between classes. Um, and also I forgot to mention with the playground area, I think Mrs. Himes mentioned, we will have hand sanitizing stations at the entrances of the playground. So kids will sanitize their hands when they enter, they'll sanitize their hands when they leave and any time in between that they want to use the sanitizer. Um, one last thing, the playground will be open during school hours only. The playground will be closed after school, but I believe Dr. Wool, the playground will be open on the weekends. It will be open on the weekends because we're gonna leave the weekends to moms and dads to supervise their own children in a manner that they feel safe. It's one of the reasons we just don't want it after school because we can't man it after school, but weekends, we're gonna open the playground so you can come on the property and hopefully have some fun and be safe. There was a question in the chat about wearing uh, masks at recess. Um, the answer to that is yes, but as recess occurs most of the time outside, it really is a perfect opportunity for kids to take mask breaks. They can you know, step aside from the, their friends for a moment or two, take their mask off, and then return it when they're ready to continue playing. And if there's a question about opening Feely Field to provide more time for a recess. I don't know that we even talked about that, but it's certainly something we can consider. It's, it, it becomes an issue of supervision. How much area is too much area for the aides to cover? So I'm sure Mrs. Himes will look into that if it becomes necessary, but thank you for the suggestion. Next slide. So just a couple of um, overall schedule changes. Um, we are going to go back to a six day cycle, A through F days. Currently we're at an A, A, B, B, C, C day. So it's almost like a 12 day cycle. Um, so we will be going back to A through F days consecutively. Orchestra and band will occur as lessons only. Um, there's a little bit more information on the band and orchestra program later in the presentation as well that I will share. AIS and support services will happen on site um, except for fully, fully virtual students. And I'm just gonna go back to band and orchestra. Those lessons will occur in person. Yes, they will. And we're excited about that. So we have begun surveillance testing because if for some reason there's an uptick in infection in our community and it shows up in our schools, we want to know sooner rather than later so that we don't end up losing control of the infection and, and for being forced to close all schools or a school. Dr. Ladewig, do you want to give us the lowdown on what's going to be happening at Harrison Avenue in the coming days? Sure. So Harrison Avenue is coming online for the surveillance testing this Thursday morning. It's actually going to be held at, uh, as a drive-through service at LMK. And the reason for that goes to some of the questions that have been raised earlier about space constraints at Harrison Avenue. We looked at every parking lot as many different ways as we could to try to host the drive-through testing at, uh, the, at Harrison Avenue School and we just couldn't do it. So we're gonna be hosting that in the uh, main lot off Nelson Avenue and LMK starting at 8 a.m. Uh, so parents uh, whose children have been identified to participate in a particular week get an email several days in advance 
uh, with information and details that I've, actually that email went out today for those uh, children that'll be tested this coming Thursday morning. Uh, the test itself will be performed by the nurse who's been trained to specifically to perform the test. The kids will stay right in their cars. And the other reason that we think that's a great idea is that it gives parents the chance to be present when their kids are tested. And we know that's important to a lot of uh, parents of elementary age children. It's also more discreet. We can do it a little bit more confidentially uh, when a child is in their car and a nurse just reaches through the window. And then the results come to us in 15 minutes. Uh, we'll be able to share those with parents uh, within 15 minutes. Uh, so there may be places to park on site while you wait, but if there aren't, you can take a little brief drive, come back within 15 minutes and we'll share the results. And then uh, with a negative result can take uh, their child to school. Uh, those kids that are going to be taking the bus or walking to school uh, will be supervised by a staff member at school. We'll have a nurse on site at Harrison Avenue School to test those kids on that day at school in the morning while the drive through testing happens at LMK. Um, we have really good participation right now from Harrison Avenue uh, parents. We have 76% of Harrison Avenue parents have given us consent to uh, have their kids participate in testing. But I'll include some links in the chat for the consent form and a brief video that just demonstrates how the test is actually administered. It's very um, pain-free and anxiety-free. Uh, we've done it now several times at purchase and um, it, uh, it's really non-invasive. So the good news is we've tested about 200 students so far and they've all come up negative. So we're that's the really good news. <laughs> yeah, really good news. That's great news. Thank you, Brian. Before we uh, go on, there's a question in the chat about uh, students having enough time to eat their yes. lunch. If they're going to be going to a different location. The truth is, is that most children are traveling at some point now. They don't all eat in the cafeteria every day on certain days. Um, most children have to eat in their classroom, so they are already traveling. Um, we have children who have to travel all the way up to the third floor, and they manage to finish because they want to get out to play. That being said, um, if your child does need uh, more time to finish their, their lunch, they will, they, they will get it and will still have time to play. Mrs. Mark Karen was smart, smiling at that remark as a former fourth and fifth grade teacher. She knows how badly they want to get out to recess and lunch. All right, next slide, please. Okay. So this next section is really an overview, right, Mel? It is, and um, it's actually my favorite part of the presentation um, because I get to talk about how we're gonna be welcoming our students back to school. Um, the slide that you see here really is, it, it's a list of uh, uh, you know activities uh, that, your, that your children will be able to engage in as we welcome them back. Um, we're ready to bring your children back and provide them with both community building activities um, and a reorientation to routines and each other. Um, these are just a few of the experiences that will take place here. Um, if you were here at Harrison Avenue last year, you recognized the book in the lower right-hand corner. Um, we introduced our students to Ordinary Mary. This really was a community building activity that all students experienced. Every student read or had the book read, read the book or had it read to them. Uh, and we chose this book because of the themes around kindness and acceptance. Um, the book that your children uh, can experience as they come back is called One Green Apple. It has the same themes of kindness and acceptance, um, but also layers in the idea of creating a sense of belonging for every student, um, and also what it feels like to be the new kid, because we know that our, as our students come back, it may feel a little bit new to them as they re-engage in, in, in one classroom community. So I very much like this slide because I think there's been a lot written about traumatized children. And that's not to say that children haven't struggled during the pandemic. And every child struggles in different ways, some emotionally, some academically. Some kids have actually thrived in this environment. And so um, I'm delighted, first of all, to have certain members of my team that I don't get to spend enough time with. You're going to hear from Jen Toscano, our supervisor of elementary special education, who comes with a very prodigious background in elementary education, was an assistant principal at the elementary level. And you'll be hearing her voice. But the reason this pyramid is important, it's important for us as parents and as educators to remember that not every child experiences these things in the same way. So certainly there are kids who need very intensive focus. 
And then there are kids who are just going to be so happy to get back to school in a few weeks, they're going to find them, their rhythm and, and, and their sense of purpose. So we're going to monitor all of that. We're not going to see every child as some monolithic set of needs, but rather a unique individual. And depending on how they present, will determine how we interact with them. So Mrs. Himes and the entire team is going to take you through this pyramid of the way in which we're going to support your kids from the SEL perspective. So at the bottom of the pyramid, the bottom two uh, tiers are really what we provide continually um, starting at the beginning of the year. The foundation of social emotional learning in Harrison Avenue is around supportive environments and building relationships and being responsive to the needs of students. We know that it will be particularly important to reconnect these concepts to our students as they come back. Um, they are two separate cohorts at the moment who have been joined together virtually, um, but have not been together with each other you know, since the beginning of the year. So those are the foundational pieces. As Dr. As Dr. Wool said, we provide targeted support as students need them. Uh, these are supports that can be provided by the classroom teacher. Um, it's also a place where the school psychologist, Mrs. Spagnola and I get involved and we use a, a variety of structures and resources to help us. Uh, the Harrison Youth Council partners with us. Um, there is explicit teaching of social emotional skills. I'm gonna give you some examples of where that lives in our classroom in a few minutes. Um, there's a lot of collaboration among all of the professionals to make sure that we, first of all, understand what your child needs, and second of all, have the correct resources and support to provide it. Jen, did you wanna add anything to Scano? I mean, you pretty much said most of it, but just, um, to, just to reiterate a little bit, as we're looking at the pyramid, those universal interventions are what we are going to do for all children. As we move up into different tiers, um, it really is um, a level of, you know, care that we provide to different students who need it, when they need it, if they need it. Um, and just to add, our psychologist, Dr. Feldman, is very well versed and very trained in trauma-informed practices, as are many of our teachers who did take um, some in-service um, courses last summer in this area as well in preparation for coming back in the fall. But those methodologies, um, we still look to um, that research to apply when all of our students are coming back in. Thanks, Jen. Mm -hmm. Oh, a color coordinated mask. This is a little girl that really has a sense of style, huh? Um, she really does. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was just trying to answer a few questions in the chat. That's okay. uh, so the slide that you see in front of you um, are the five principles that really speak to the social emotional development of elementary children. Um, from the time they are in kindergarten, we teach them the concepts and the skills of self-management, self-awareness, relationship skills, uh, and responsible decision making. Um, we don't typically teach these skills to students as a separate entity, although um, you may go into a teacher's classroom and find them having a class meeting or a morning meeting uh, because they feel that this is, uh, they feel that one of these skills is, you know, particularly pertinent at the time. Uh, we try to layer this into the curriculum. Um, and we teach these principles to students to make sure that they have problem solving skills, um, that they have coping mechanisms and that they can make good decisions. I'm going to share a few classroom examples with you of you know, where this lives in the classroom. Um, even though these are activities that your children uh, may have done already, the reason that I'm highlighting them is so that you can see how social emotional teaching will continue to happen within the curriculum and not as a separate entity. And before we flip this slide, because I like to remind people of how we work as an organization, these core principles come from the work of an organization called CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning. You can go on their website. You can understand the kind of research behind the way these things are thoughtfully constructed and where the research comes from. We, we never start with our own good ideas. We're always trying to vet our thinking against some external research. So next slide. And there are two questions in the chat I don't know the answer to about bringing your iPads back and forth. Somebody maybe can respond to those. But 
self-awareness and self-management now is this slide directed at me mrs himes I'm here. I'll, I'll let you decide <laughs> <laughs> okay. i'll take the fifth on that right now um so yes these are two learning activities that were directed um, towards self-awareness and self-management. The one on the left was an upper elementary activity. Um, it was actually part of writing workshop uh, for a fourth grade class. So the content, uh, the academic content that was taught uh, that's represented in this slide is about descriptive writing. Uh, the self-awareness piece comes in because the writing assignment was for, was for children to choose their best attributes and explain why they felt they were their best attributes. It teaches kids to be in tune with how they are feeling. Um, this particular student said that his best attribute was his smile because it was a way for him to use his facial expressions uh, to express his emotions. Um, so it was a, a very sophisticated understanding of that particular mm -hmm. assignment. Uh, on the right side, um, you know, our littlest learners still have big feelings and they don't always have the tools and the strategies to, uh, to cope with them. This is a, a direct teaching tool that teaches little ones to recognize their feelings, um, to kind of stop and take a breath, to think about some strategies they can use, um, and then ultimately to, to make good decisions. Even our first graders uh, learn the entities of responsible decision-making. Um, this also was an activity that was done in a first grade class in the beginning of the school year. Um, it's a class contract and the first graders themselves decided what kind of uh, learning behaviors and social behaviors uh, all of the students would agree to um, during the school day. As the two cohorts come back together as one, this class contract will be really important to look back on so that as one class community, they can reflect on the decisions that they made around the best uh, learning and social behaviors. And the last activity that I'll share with you is one that speaks to social awareness and relationship skills. This is also an upper elementary uh, learning activity. It was a reading workshop activity. Um, the students were learning the elements of a story, but the teacher with great intentionality chose a book that speaks to empathy and, and also the outcomes that our decisions have on other people and, and the impact that we have on other people. So, Mr. Greenfield, I think you're going to talk to this. And I just want to say that, you know, our physical education program is one that we're extremely proud of because it emphasizes the social emotional well being of kids, not just learning how to play a sport or a particular activity. Good evening, Michael. Hello, Dr. Wall. Um, Mr. Galano, our director of physical education, and I have. Uh, talked at great length about how to put physical education in a, this pivotal role for reopening. Our physical education teachers are always paying attention to movement. Certainly there are constraints um, given social distancing, but movement still remains obviously a priority of physical education. But um, it's worth noting that our physical education program stands at the forefront of uh, work around mindfulness. Our teachers are, are very well trained to think about the whole child and how physical education, health and wellness is a mindful activity, not just a physical activity. And so this concept of mindfulness, well-being um, is very much at the forefront of their work as they plan for reopening. And we see the physical education program serving this uh, very important role in actually accelerating um, uh, other kinds of uh, work tied to social emotional connections. As an example, um, uh, students are going to be given many opportunities to connect with one another in uh, orchestrated ways. And certainly as the weather gets better um, and the outdoors becomes more inviting, uh, teachers will be focusing attention on how to bring students outdoors and uh, and build obviously movement, mindfulness, and uh, uh, well-being. Thank you, Michael. So this will get into a little bit more detail about the music program. 
I met today with our acting director of Fine and Performing Arts. We're still trying to find ways to bring more in-person learning to the arts. We have purchased what are called bell covers for all of our wind instruments, but we're still not able, once we can get outdoors on a more regular basis, we'll be able to bring the band kids back together for full band, we hope. Who's speaking to this slide? I don't know. I am, Dr. Okay, Wolf. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the children at Harrison Avenue really love the music program. We have excellent um, music teachers, Mrs. Bennett, Mr. Bennett, and uh, Mr. Crozier has joined our team. Um, you know, the social emotional component of the fine and, fine and performing arts program, um, there's so much to it. It's so important to children, um, especially our fourth and fifth graders who are starting band and orchestra. Um, once all the students return, um, music and art will occur one time per six day cycle. As I had mentioned earlier, we're going back to the A through F consecutive days. As for band and orchestra, they will be in the form of lessons. It'll be also on a rotating schedule one time every six days in person for those kids who are coming to school. Those kids who are virtual will still zoom in for, for their musical lessons. Um, as, and as you had mentioned, Dr. Wool, we, are, um, we have placed an order for PPE for certain musical instruments as well. So and I also to... want to add for band lessons, um, the guidelines are 12 feet apart and for orchestra, six feet apart. And I've been working with uh, the local associ music association of teachers because we believe we have research that says when you use a bell cover, it's just a very strong, um, almost like a mask for a horn, we can get back to six feet, which would give us a lot more flexibility. So we are working on every front. We're never standing still. I don't know about you guys, maybe I'm the only guy on this call, but I actually miss going to elementary, middle school and high school concerts. Uh, and I know how critically important it is for kids. And I'm a little bit frustrated because we were much more able to get sports up and running, but we have struggled with the arts. And part of that is parent advocacy. And we're, we're working on building that advocacy with you. Now, this is where I'd like to take a pause because I I think there's something I want you to think about. So we've talked about the physical well-being of your children and of our faculty and staff. We've talked about the social and emotional well-being of your children and indirectly of your faculty and staff because your generosity and patience with them is going to go a long way to support them mentally. But I was reading an article, I think it was in the journal news maybe four or five days ago, where a bunch of folks who run school districts like mine were saying they don't know where their kids are and they don't know necessarily where to begin the academic journey. Well, I can assure you that's not the case here. And I know that lots of parents have anxiety about that, but you, what you will learn in the next several slides is that we weren't waiting for somebody to tell us that we need to know where your kids were going to be. We started planning to track their learning as we moved into this model last year right around March, we said, you know what, this could go on. How do we track and use some tools that we have access to, to determine where will your kids be if we're forced to remain in this model? So you're going to hear more about that. But I wanted to also give you some comfort because I know everybody's afraid that their children have lost so much, but we have a plan and our plan is to get your kids back to where they need to be by September. They may not get fully there, but they're gonna be well on the road. And if they don't get there by September, we will get them there. And it won't be by accident, it'll be by design. Next slide. So my very esteemed long-term colleague, Assistant Superintendent Michael Greenfield will take you through, and I deliberately put this slide up, I know it's busy, but I want you to learn something about your school system this is the model we use. We research, we design, we engage in action research, we implement, and then we do it all over again, all with the intent of trying to be ready for what's coming. And Michael has done a masterful job of navigating this water for us. Mr. Greenfield? Thank you, Dr. Wall. I think you captured the key, the key points um, of what we want uh, you to take away from this next series. How are we preparing your children academically? for return in September. 
And we know that um, it's, you know, these are extraordinary circumstances. So uh, we are as prepared as any school system can be. Your teachers are as prepared as any elementary um, teachers can be. And we have a tremendous confidence in not just our roadmap, which has these uh, five key elements that we um, have, I wouldn't say perfected, but we've certainly um, developed great fluency using over many years. So um, we have a systemic approach. We have a systematic approach and we have a personalized approach. So I wanna capture those three big ideas, the systems, uh, the systematic part, the, the systemic part and the personalized part. And while nobody expects you to follow the, all of these details, there's some highlights uh, here that I want to point out. Um, we have been building this instructional plan for many, many years, and we took that overlay and that expertise and applied it in March, uh, certainly looking ahead and anticipating uh, what perhaps uh, nobody could have anticipated. A year later, we are still um, talking about reopening and on the for forefront of reopening. But um, we engage outside experts as well as our internal expertise uh, among our faculty. Those external experts um, have helped us to anticipate what students' learning would look like and how we could get prepared for gaps that might occur um, as a result of um, this pandemic based on prior pandemics. I'm going to take you through that in just a moment. Um, but I want to key in on, you took last year as an example, we ran summer programs that served uh, more than 500 students overall, more than 250 elementary students directly. And by way of example, we build upon that success. So we have structures um, that have built, we have professional development for teachers and program designs that we are working on now, adapting for this coming summer. Um, last year, we ran more than 75 in-district uh, in-service courses led by faculty, led by our, our instructional leaders, le led by outside experts, and those served um, more than 500 teacher registrants. So we have tremendous capacity to pivot in, in real time and pivot in a very planful and strategic uh, way. The last piece uh, I'll add is we have data systems and uh, our data systems are sophisticated. We rely obviously on our teacher expertise. We know that our teachers know your children, but we also triangulate data. Um, we go out and uh, look at standardized measures to ensure that we know as much as we possibly can about students and their learning. Can you move to the next slide? And just to drill down, we engaged an organization who are national experts in uh, research and development, educational research and development, uh, by the name of Hanover Research as one example. We gave them three years of uh, student data to study, and they used research in the field that um, took uh, advantage of not pandemics like this one in the past, but school closures that they could model projected um, learning loss is a term that's often bandied about and we're not so comfortable with it, but it's a, a term that certainly uh, we acknowledge may be um, very real. We know students learn at different rates. They took these data and modeled uh, projected uh, learning gains and learning losses. And we use that data as part of our pre preparation for teachers to return and for our preparations for a summer design program. And so this is a, a process that is ongoing and we have tremendous confidence in that ongoing system as well as the teacher expertise. Next slide, please. And in a moment, I'm gonna turn this over to Christian McCourtney, my colleague at the, from the elementary and instructional uh, director to talk about this process in more detail, in more concrete ways. But I wanna leave you with this. If you look at the left-hand side of this screen versus the right-hand side, you're looking at two different grade levels, a primary grade level and an upper elementary grade level. And what you're looking at here is uh, our results of student performance on a standardized measure that helps us to track their progress from March through the end of uh, this year into uh, the winter. And the purpose of showing this slide is to give you an idea that we are tracking cohort performance 
as students progress at a grade level, we are also tracking them individually. So um, every single dot on this um, chart, we know as an individual student, and you can see that students, uh, some students have exceeded the average growth, which is the dotted line uh, that travels uh, um, diagonally in this slide. Many students have exceeded it. Many students have not, and they have, uh, um, there obviously have gaps in their growth. The key here is that we know that there are, um, there's projected growth and then there's actual, and we're looking at both. We projected perhaps students' uh, performance, and we found that many students are exceeding it. In other cases, we find that students um, are uh, underperforming, and then we know who they are, we know where they're underperforming, and we have a game plan to address these gaps. I'm going to turn it out over to uh, Mr. McCourtney, who is going to talk a little further about the data that we collect in multiple measures and also um, how we convert that into an instructional practice and a summer program. Mr. McCourtney. Thank you, Mr. Greenfield. So to expand on Mr. Greenfield's points, uh, we'll illustrate how we take the information that we gather on students to turn it into programmatic and curriculum changes, as well as make adjustments right inside the classroom with students. And uh, Jen Markarian will follow up with what that looks like in Harrison Avenue School. But what you're looking at right now is that all of the information that we gather comes from our students. Our students are at the heart of everything that we do in Harrison Avenue School. And they, we learn from them what they know, what they understand, and what they're ready to learn. And as Mr. Greenfield alluded to, the NWA map in the top of our wheel of multiple measures, we don't just rely on one measure to find out everything that we need to know about a student. We use multiple measures. The map is a powerful tool for us as it tells us about uh, learning trends that exist within a classroom, within a grade level, within a school, or within a grade level across all of our schools. Our instructional leadership team uses that information to make programmatic decisions, but our teachers use that information as well to partner with what they've learned about individual students. They can actually see, based on what MAP is revealing, what next skill a student is ready to learn, and they design planning with that information in mind. Classroom artifacts that our teachers collect are an invaluable part of our multiple measure system. They develop real-time information when they use classroom artifacts, which could be anything like work samples, or it could be um, an exit ticket or observational data that they gain from a conversation that's happening in the classroom to use and make adjustments in real time and pivot their instruction right within that lesson. We have a system of local assessments that is both formative and summative. That is that we give these assessments mid unit of study to determine how students are moving towards the standards that exist within a unit of study, as well as a summative assessment to look at how well we've taught into those standards. Our students are also provided with opportunities to reflect on their own learning which provides us with a perspective of what their experience is like, as well as gives them ownership over this process. And finally, teacher feedback is an invaluable part of this wheel, as it gives us information from our professionals in the field that give us the feedback we need to make adjustments to things like a scope and sequence so that we can put attention on the areas that students are demonstrating they need. Mr. McCourney, before you leave this slide, there was a question um, about the New York State assessments. And uh, um, the New York State assessments in grades three through eight are, are currently uh, being reviewed by the state. They, um, we are not in control of whether those get offered or not. Um, the state has uh, applied for a waiver from the federal government and they are awaiting feedback. The latest information I got, and Mr. Sullivan just shared that with us today, is that if the state is granted the waiver, there will not be um, exams in grades uh, three through eight in math, uh, ELA, and uh, science, four through eight. Um, but if they are denied the waiver, it'll be a one-day um, assessment instead of two, and the uh, science will be a written exam only, and they will uh, abandon the performance measure. I'd like to just add two things to that. Thank you, Michael. Um, it's a good question, by the way, whoever asked it. Um, 
And sometimes it's very difficult for us to know what we really want and what's in the best interest. So I am an advocate for administering those tests because they're at a national level and not every state is taking care of its children the way New York is. But there is a waiver in the federal guidance that we are advocating for because we don't just accept the rules, we try to influence them as we talked about earlier. And I'm advocating if there has to be an assessment, even if it's a singular measure, that it should be moved to September where we could make good use of it and use it as a formative assessment. Um, but that will require some lobbying and we may be coming to you uh, when that gets more timely and, and the issue ripens. But I just wanna take a pause here. Remember why you're looking at these slides. You're saying, this is a reopening. Why do we need to know this? Because what most people are concerned about is how do you know where our children are? And Michael gave you an example of tracking three years of data and having a scatter plot that gives us an example of where your kids are and where they should be. And Christian just showed you the multiple measure forms. Also want to point out that Mr. McCourtney is a Harrison teacher who's moved up through the ranks to become the, the uh, supervisor of elementary education. Mrs. Mark Carrion has was always a phenomenal teacher, still is, but now is an instructional coach. And Mrs. Dondrea is the director of mathematics, was also a teacher here in Harrison. We draw from the best of who we are and try to expand that just like we do with your kids. So there's a, a story upon a story upon a story here. And I think we're shifting now to that fine instructional approach. Is that right, Mr. McCourtney? That is correct. So with the information that we've already gathered from this year, as recently as last week, our instructional team in conjunction with feedback from teachers have already re-essentialized elements of our academic calendar to make the most sense and, um, uh, and prioritize certain standards for the remainder of this year. But what we're also using that information for is to develop our summer student programs to position students to be ready for success in the fall. Our first program that we're focusing in on our development of is the Foundational Concepts and Skills Program. And this will feel similar to the Historical Bridges Program. We'll meet for approximately three weeks. Students will be invited into the program based on the needs that they demonstrate that they have. And we will offer it for students exiting kindergarten through fifth grade with a focus on mathematics and literacy. Our enrichment workshops are something new this year and something we're very excited to offer and are really born out of the idea that we know that the pandemic has had effect on all learners. Our goal in all of our programs, inclusive of what remains in our spring, is to bring back joy into our learning. And this is a great place where we're going to do that. In our enrichment workshops, we could experience things such as an engineering workshop where students build a Bossel wood bridge or a cooking class with precisely measured ingredients to create a, a wonderful feast, perhaps a reader's theater that ends in a production or a coding class where we can uncover the magic of our computers that we've been working on all year long. Finally, our summer community connection event is a new as well. And we are designing this to bring our communities together in a whole school function that will position students to connect with each other once again and be ready to enter the fall uh, socially and emotionally. Before we shift, first of all, I love this slide, Mr. McCourtney. This is a really nice slide. I, love, I don't know who took the pictures, but um, our board president is here and are the chairman of our budget committee. And I'm certain that they recognize these three elements because everything in our district happens at the same time. So I've been doing budget presentations. This, we're up to, we're coming up on number three, we've done two. And these are part of our, our budget proposal because in order to put these kinds of programs into the summer, we need to prepare for that budget process. So these three ideas, I think, speak to the heart and soul of who children are, right? They certainly might need to catch up, but they also want to connect with one another and they want to remember that there's joy in learning. All of that requires planning and funding. Everybody on this Zoom and on this panel has, has a part in making this happen. So Mrs. Mulvoy Mangan, Mrs. Wolverton, thank you. Next slide. Just uh, if you mind holding for one second, Chad. Sure, love to. Uh, an added note that might be useful to you is that we want to make sure that our enrichment uh, workshops are available to all students. So we'll be mindful of our scheduling to ensure that students in the Foundational Concepts and Skills Program have those opportunities as well. Good follow up, Christian. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jen. Hi, Jen. 
So we are looking at a timeline now, and this is indicating that everything that we do from the spring of 2021 all the way through the summer is positioning us all for a successful fall. Inclusive in the summer that was not discussed in the previous slide is a robust teacher professional development program that Mr. Greenfield alluded to in his presentation. And here we'll have a number of different courses that students can take. They will be based and generated off of our data that we harness from the uh, multiple measures, as well as uh, up-to-date trends in education and uh, best research practices. So that brings us to what's on the most immediate horizon, and that is our spring. If we could go to the next slide, please. Hey, Christian, what I also think is important in that slide, you make a really good point that people should view this as a process. The kids are gonna come back, they're gonna struggle a little bit, they're gonna find their way, but we're looking at this as a bridge, a bridge to September. So this is a connected set of uh, steps that we're taking to bring your kids to where they need to be. So everybody at home, don't expect that it'll all get better overnight, but it is going to get better. We've heard on a few occasions how this reopening is going to feel like a first day of school. And while that's true in some respects, it's not exactly true in others. For one example, your students are known by your teachers. Our teachers have actually expressed to me that they may have been able to learn your who the students are at a more rapid rate than in years past, because through the hybrid model, they were able to experience those kids in small groups and cohorts. Now our teachers worked very hard to develop a community within those small cohorts. And now they're thinking about how are we bringing those students back together to create one community out of two. And that work didn't just, won't be beginning on the reopening, it's already begun. And Jim Arcarian will speak to that and more in just a moment. But our teachers also already know your students likes and dislikes, their hopes and dreams, as well as their areas of academic strength and room for growth. So with that information that they already have, they're eager to have more face-to-face -face instructional time after the reopening to really personalize that experience for students and target where each child is and provide that education that they need in that moment. So Ms. Markarian, do you mind expanding on that idea. Jen, before we do, let's Christian, Jen, everybody look into the chat because there's a bunch of questions that have been generated that might be helpful, starting with Natalia. Um, Mrs. Himes, you can look at that. After school activities and after care, nothing new there, but you can weigh in on that, Val. You're, you're muted. Somebody tell that. There you Sorry. go. Sorry. Um, after school, um, formal after school activities begin at the middle school and into the high school. Um, we do have an after school child care program uh, that's provided by the Harrison Children's Center, but is housed at Harrison Avenue School. And you can call our main office and get information about that. Good. And also, we hope. A lot will be dependent on how infection rates go if things continue to get better that everything in the summer will be in person that's our goal we'll let you know we don't have a timeline yet typically we let you know sometime in late april early may as to uh, which summer programs you are invited to based on need but we are as christian said going to have summer programs that are available to everybody irrespective of need based on interest uh, grade level X. Oh, the question is, what are these expectations, the, the kids that have gaps based on? How did we identify them? I'll give that to either Christian or Jen. I'll happily answer that. Um, and we'll speak to that in a minute. But the answer to all of that is yes. <laughs> so grade level expectations is something that teachers are always focused on. But know that the other issue is meeting students exactly where they are. And so for many years, I've been in the district almost 20 years now, it has always been a question of where are my students and where am I leading them to? What are the incremental steps that I can put into place to help support them? And so just as always, we are going to be asking that question of where are the students right now? How can we meet them where they are, but also keep in mind the longer term goals 
and what steps can be put into place to help them meet those goals over time. Okay, Jen, next slide, please. Okay, thank, thank you. So as so many of my colleagues spoke about, building community and relationships has always been a critical part of our work here at Harrison Avenue School. And teachers are already utilizing a variety of tools and practices to bring both the Husky and Pride students together to learn and grow as one. Those tools will continue to be used as we come back together to both engage our students and enhance their learning. This fourth grade teacher, and you see Mrs. Umbrino with her two students here, this fourth grade teacher has crafted a shared experience using a digital tool called a Jamboard. Here we have a student learning from home and another learning from the school building, able to share the pen to create mathematical models while thinking and talking through the work together. We know that students learn both from their teacher and from each other, and this experience and others like it will continue to support our students as we come back together again. So much of what we do is helping them to learn from one another and see their value as both teachers in the classroom and learners in the classroom. Next slide, please. Thank you. As Mr. Greenfield and Mr. McCourtney shared, the district uses external and internal assessments to gauge student progress in order to personalize the learning. Our teachers use these assessments along with their expertise in content to meet students, as I was speaking about before, where they are, while planning for where they need to go. In this photo, we have a second grade teacher who's working with a small group of students. She's planned this lesson based on data from a variety of assessments and observations conducted in the classroom. As a result of her analysis, the teacher has created a lesson around reading fluency, reading with great expression and attention to punctuation, with the knowledge that this work will also support comprehension. Following this learning experience, this small group of students remains focused on their goal through independent activities posted to Seesaw. And Seesaw is a learning platform teachers have been using for quite a while and are currently using to provide practice opportunities for students. This student practiced her fluency by recording herself as she read and then Mrs. Rostowski was able to listen to her recording and provide targeted feedback. That feedback let the student know what she had been successful with and what next steps are ahead for her. These responsive small groups that all teachers use and targeted independent experiences support students in achieving their own personalized goals. Next slide. While we value teacher expertise, we also value student voice, building student autonomy and giving students choice in their learning. So self-assessments like this one allow for students to examine their own learning and provide teachers with a window into a student's understanding of their own strengths and areas for improvement. This here is the work of a first grade learner who is writing a personal narrative. As he works through this unit, he and his classmates are being explicitly taught what successful writers do. And as he revises, he uses this checklist to hold up a mirror to his work, giving him actionable next steps to make his writing more organized and more effective. This is a practice that occurs at every level here at Harrison Avenue. Whether you're in first grade or fifth grade, teachers plan and prioritize experiences that support students as they grow into independent learners and people. And so your teachers and all of us are so excited to be welcoming back your students and thrilled to be continuing this journey with them as we support them in becoming those independent learners and, and people. Christian, there was a question in the chat about the timeline for the summer programs. Do we have that yet? Not yet. I'm in the process of responding to that question, but as soon as we have that information, we will reveal it to the district. Dr. Wool, was there anything else that you wanted to share before I close? Sorry, no, I was muted. Um, Yes, thank you, Mrs. Himes. First of all, thanks to the team for uh, their hard work and all of the preparation. I will say out loud, Harrison Avenue is our largest elementary school. It poses the most uh, challenges logistically, so your support of Jen and Valerie is greatly appreciated and your teachers and your support of one another is greatly appreciated. Just want to reiterate a couple of things in case it wasn't clear. I will have a final 
determination as to whether or not everybody's coming back on the 22nd. You'll get an email probably the Thursday night saying we're all back or it's K3, uh, K4. Hopefully it's gonna be everybody will simplify everybody's life. I'll let you know as soon as the truck leaves Texas. The second thing I wanna to say to you is that um, this has been a tough, tough experience for you. We know that. We know how much stress you've been under and we are so excited to have your kids back. In order to keep them back, we have to truly work as a community. Um, what happened at the high school after the February break was not pretty. Um, lots of kids uh, came to school, caused other kids to be quarantined, to lose opportunities. We had teams go down. The COVID is not gone. The variant is still quite infectious. Um, and even though the myth is that kids don't get sick, I have kids at the high school who've gotten really sick. We've had some elementary kids who've gotten quite sick. I'm not worried so much about kids getting sick, but there's always that possibility. And so it is our collective decision to behave responsibly when we're not together that will determine whether or not our schools will succeed. I have every confidence that between vaccination, masking, ventilation, surveillance testing, and strict adherence to cleansing protocols, we're gonna keep your kids safe. I know some people have said on this chat, for example, why do you have to wait for the ventilation systems? Because I don't think it's safe otherwise. Uh, there are other school systems that will bring them back with barriers at three feet of social distance. Because it can be done doesn't mean it should be done. We don't do what other districts do, we do our homework, and we think about one thing and one thing as our primary concern. What is in the best interest of your children? So if we can continue to work together, I hope that you learn tonight that we have been planning every minute of the day for a very long time for this moment. We are so excited. I'm gonna be reaching out to the PTAs very soon because I think our buildings need to be decorated in any way they can to say, welcome back. We are finally a learning community again, but we are, aren't gonna stay that way unless we stay strong and we stay disciplined. So I wanna thank Mrs. Himes, Mrs. Bagnola, Mrs. Toscano, Mrs. Markarian, Mr. McCourtney, Dr. Lady, Mr. Greenfield, Veronica, who did, you didn't get to hear tonight, Kelly Mulvoy Mangan for sitting another night out away from her family and Lindy Wolverton, who will be with me tomorrow night again in the Citizens Budget Advisory Committee. These are people that care about your children. We do care from the bottom of our hearts, but we need your help. So Mrs. Himes, having said that, it's all you to say good night. Um, before we close, thank you again to the parents and to our teachers who have done so much to continue the learning process for our children here. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who work behind the scenes uh, that we don't who that we don't see every day, um, who have also worked tirelessly to keep everything moving and together. Um, and safe here at Harrison Avenue. Our custodial staff, our office staff, our nurses and our assistants in our health office, our aides, our teaching assistants, uh, those are people that uh, you probably don't see or speak to on a daily basis, um, but they really are part of the cornerstone of what makes Harrison Avenue a special place to learn and to work. Um, and I, I thank them really for everything that they have done. And if you will stick with me um, for 90 more seconds, I promise you it'll be worth it. Oh, I know it's coming. Take a look at what your children have learned this year at Harrison Avenue and have a good night. Jen, I don't know if you can hear me. The sound's not working. Yeah, the sound, didn't, unfortunately, the sound didn't happen. Okay, sorry. That's okay. You can restart. I had it on mute. My apologies. I'll start again.
We think here comes the sun means like joy and happiness is coming and better things will happen soon. Here comes the sun means like a new beginning, a new day, some hope in the air and it's like rising to a new beginning. Here comes the happiness, here comes the joy, and here comes the brightness. Just keep smiling everyone and we'll do this together. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Right. Have a Good sunny night. Too. Good night. Thanks, Valerie. Thanks, everybody.